Welcome to the Lead More Podcast. I'm your host, John T. Meyer. The Lead More Podcast is the show where we sit down with leaders of today to help inspire and create more leaders for tomorrow. I sat down here with my friend for episode 37, Alex Guggenberger. Alex is the original founder of Joe Beakey, a company he started in his college dorm room at Augustana University. He worked on that for several years as a, a college student and freshly out of college, a young professional, and recently uh, rolled that down and decided to join a startup. And when I reached out to Alex and asked him to be on the show, he said, well, why, why do you want me on a leadership show? And I told him, I believe leaders come in all shapes and sizes, different job titles, different parts of their career. And Alex is just a continual learner and someone that inspires me, even someone younger who still inspires me. And in this episode, you'll see that. He talks about how he really optimized his company to learn, how being an entrepreneur forced him to become a networker, and now what he's learned working inside a company. So you'll see both sides of that. So if you are a young leader, a person who wants to start a company, whether within a company or out on your own, you'll learn a lot from this episode with Alex Guggenberger. So let's get right to it. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Lead More podcast. I'm here with my friend today, Alex Guggenberger, the Googs. How are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited to dive into this conversation. Uh, I'll start it by saying uh, we were texting yesterday and I said, hey, you should come on the Lead More podcast. And I think your response was, um, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why was that your response? I think, uh, I think for me, I look up, I look up to leaders that have a lot of experience that are a lot different than me. And I never really realized that my experience is unique. I think that's sure. like the big thing. And, um, I also, I think I was, there was a lot of part of it, a lot of it that was like fear oriented. So one of the quotes that I kind of live by is, uh, everything you want is on the other side of fear It's by Jack, Jack Canfield. And I think yeah. that was like kind of my first response was that response was like pushing it away because it's like, Oh, Oh, this is like, I didn't prepare or. Yeah. Uh, I'm not qualified or anything like that. So like the fear definitely is part of that, but also like there's people like uh, Liz Georgie that like I look up to and have always looked up to over Twitter and have had a few mm-hmm. conversations with and, uh, and I just yeah, like, and I didn't know about myself, her, so you, t- you told me about her. That's yeah. How we met. And, and, and that's one of the things like I putting myself as like in that category just doesn't seem right. But then once you kind of explained why I was like, Oh, that's actually, that's perfect. It's because you're that leader of tomorrow that's trying to get trained. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you focus on is like, let's learn from the leaders of today to build better leaders of tomorrow. And I think like, yeah, I can be a leader today, but I also have a lot, a, a lot to grow on and a lot to get into for being a leader tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, episode one, Governor Dugard, most listened to episode of the Lead More podcast. I think part of it is just because it's also the longest one out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, none of us, no one on the show has been a governor. Um, yeah. I'm guessing that we don't maybe aspire to be a governor. Uh, so that's one type of guest, but you're exactly right. I want people, a lot of people we know that listen to the Lead More podcast, um, maybe don't see themselves as leaders yet, but I believe, you know, they want to become one and are working toward it. And, uh, and that's certainly where I feel like you are. And as someone who's what, just four years removed from college, you've still had a pretty unique start of your career, probably not traditional. Um, yeah, definitely not traditional. <laughs> so I want to dive into that. So let's start there. Uh, I remember reading a, I was reading a newspaper at Queen City. I don't know if it was an Argus, it must have been an Argus article, but it was something about this. I don't think it would have been the August and the newspaper at Queen City. So it was some, maybe the business journal or some story about this kid at college at Augustana who was starting a company that I thought basically was like a job board, uh, but it had something about company culture. So tell us when you first got your idea to start a company in your dorm room. Yeah, uh, I love the idea of starting at my dorm room. Um, I think everyone loves that image. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, story. I would say, I would say it really, it really came out of like scratching my own itch. I think that's as a, at a young age, you don't have a lot of experience. Like you don't have all these, uh, all these problems that you found out when you were in the business world and like discovered and were able to build upon. It was really just this idea of like, Hey, looking for a job sucks. Like that's really how it started. Um, I was finishing up a internship at secure and financial group, uh, up in the cities and ended up getting a full-time job offer, which was awesome. But I kind of thought, Hey, like that's a really good security blanket to lean on. But at the same time, I was like, I don't know if I want to work financial industry. I don't know really what exactly I want to do. 
I still want to explore. I want to work for a fast growing company. Uh, and I want to work for an organization that like doesn't just have me as an intern, not, not just a number. And so that's really what started that kind of conversation and just started talking with all my friends who were looking for work and other interns. And even when I was working at the um, at security and I was meeting with their head of HR to chat about this idea. And really what it came down to was it's the job search is so transactional and that's what is so frustrating about it. You, when you press apply, you say, Hey, judge me, compare me to others. And that's inherently mm-hmm. just not a thing that anyone wants to do. And it's just sure. very scary to do that. So that's why people just press apply a hundred times and you play the numbers yeah. and, and that's where it really started at. And then the catalyst was when I actually presented it at the um, innovation expo, my mm-hmm. senior year and presented the student idea competition and ended up winning $300 from it, which I used to get my domain from somebody for a hundred dollars or $150. I can't remember. Uh, and that was kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that was, that was kind of the, Oh, people understand the problem that I'm explaining. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things that I realized. And that was like the first businessy thing I ever did. Like there were some other things in my past, but I was never the, I want to be my own boss. I never wanted to own my own business. I was fine climbing the corporate ladder. Like that was totally fine know. with me. And so that's why I always say when people ask like, oh, like how'd you get an entrepreneurship? I always say I'm an accidental entrepreneur. Hmm. And I think a lot of people do fit in that category. It was never, I was never seeking out ideas and just throwing them on the table and testing them out. It was constantly okay, what's next? What organization am I going to go to? How am I going to work my way up? Uh, and Jabiki was scary in that sense where it was, okay, can I go my own path or should I, or should I uh, do what everyone else is really telling me to do? But that was like the, the intro was scratching my own itch um, and getting other people to actually recognize that this is a problem. And then from there, it was just learning from everyone. I had no experience in entrepreneurship. Um, traditional colleges, especially Augie, uh, Sadly, I loved my experience at Augie, but like colleges struggle to intro people to entrepreneurship and offer a lot of those resources. And they're getting a lot better. And I think Sioux Falls is getting a lot better than I started. I was the, I was the lone entrepreneur in, in, at Augie and in, in Sioux Falls, I guess. Uh, and at your age, at least, yeah. At my age, at least. And that was like something that I was like, oh, like this is, this is cool. This is glamorous. But uh, I, I realized that it's, it's becoming a lot more popular. People are looking at it as something that they can go after. And I think um, the Sioux Falls in general is becoming a lot more entrepreneurial. Like even in the four or five years after college, it's, it's blown up. Um, yeah. And I think that's a part of people like me that are in college and saying, hey, let's do something different um, yeah. and getting the funding and meeting with as many people as possible, like reaching out to you and just saying, hey, I want to learn. And I think more people are willing to do that now. Well, I want to go. So I want to go back to the two paths when you're sitting there as a college, like which path to take, because I remember meeting you at my cousin's um, groom's dinner because you're in my cousin's wedding. <laughs> and that's how I met yep. you. And I remember being like, I like this kid. Like he reminds me of a younger me. And I remember thinking uh, I took, I, I interned for a entrepreneur the summer after my junior year, before my senior year of college, didn't really know what an entrepreneur was. Uh, this guy, Jason, did um, Google ads, like early days, Google ads and SEO mm-hmm. work. And so I worked for him my senior year and he offered me a job. You know, he's like, take your laptop, work hourly, wherever you want to work. And this is 2008. So it was like crazy to me. But I also went to a school very much like uh, Augie, where they have like career counselors and they do job fairs and they push you sort of toward a path that they think you yeah. might succeed in. Got a great job offer doing corporate consulting. And I sat there my senior year, like, do I take this very unknown, compelling thing as a, working with an entrepreneur or this safe job that had a nice salary and I got to move to Minneapolis? And I chose the latter and then, you know, yeah. only made it 11 months in the corporate world until <laughs> I came back. But I kind of feel like you also had that choice. You had a job offer from a job you had already had. But then you sort of got pulled in, like you, like you just described accidentally. So I know a lot of people have probably been in. But there's two of us who have been in this situation. Describe that those paths that you were trying to weigh and decide which way to go, or was the problem yeah, just I, so compelling that you had to go that way? Um, I don't know if the problem was so compelling. Um, I think it was the the new path, the exciting path versus the one that I know like 
oh, there is a lot of, there's this path in front of me at this organization. And luckily I actually had a lot of leverage in that role because I already had an internship. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to about April or May um, of of, uh, finishing up college, I contacted my recruiter and HR contact there and I said, hey, uh, I got into the Zeal Center for Entrepreneurship Accelerator Program with this company that you already know about because I was always telling them. And I said, Mm do you mind if I take, if I just delay six months, my start date? Mm. And they're like, absolutely. Like you need to go after that. You need to learn and we'll be here when you, when you finish. And it was kind of similar to you where it was about two months after I did that in June or June or July, I called them and I said, Hey, I'm not coming back. Like I knew, and it wasn't necessarily that, that, uh, that Jabiki was going to be a crazy success because it really wasn't, we didn't even launch at that point. But it was that I knew that this type of work was something that just got me up in the morning and the other didn't. Um, And it's financial services. Some people find joy in different things. And for me, it was, I want to work on a problem that's really, really cool. And that's really solving, uh, solving a a key um, problem in the market. And, And that was one of the things that kind of forced me through to go on my own path. But I, I also had parents that were 100% willing to let me sleep uh, sleep on the in my bedroom at, at home, and uh, they were willing to kind of support me in any way that they in any way that they could. Uh, but I never grew up with entrepreneurs in my family, and so it was never a thing that my parents ever knew was a common thing for kids to do out of college. Um, they were just really supportive in, hey, you're going to learn a lot. Even if, even if you only work this on, work on this for three to six months, like you're going to learn a crazy amount that you would never learn in the corporate environment in years because you just have to do it all yourself. And so I always, whenever I look at things, I look at like making decisions. I think one of the things I always look at is the aspect of uh, what am I going to learn from this situation and have that plan in the beginning part. Um, One of the things that I always, uh, that I always was hesitant to do was network and this kind of forced me to network and learn from other people. And I think always having that idea of, okay, like what's the goal outside of the business, outside of success of the business, like what do I want to get out of this personally that can propel me into the future roles that I want to do in the future? Because I knew yep. Yep. if Jabiki fails, if Jabiki goes, is, is great. Like that's awesome, but there's always going to be something next. Yeah. Um, either I'm going to exit and go do something else, or I'm going to stop working on Jabiki and join a full-time organization, which I now ended up doing. Uh, I think the things that I was able to learn and the path set and goals that I had for myself outside of just the success of the business, but really me personally and my learnings that I wanted from, from this experience uh, were, were able to really kind of put me in a really good spot for the future. And so I think when you look at that path, for me at that path, it was, okay, I can go, I can go this path, which is comfortable, um, which is, doesn't have any fear. Um, or I can go at this path that is a lot more, that has discomfort. That is definitely going to be a lot harder, but I'm able to kind of level up a lot faster because I'm in charge yeah. of all these things. So it sounds like you optimize for, for learning, for growth, yeah. for, you know, no matter what happens, I'll be, I'll, I'll be better, further, faster. Did you yeah. have like a check, a checklist or was that more just organic? You just felt like the unknown path was going to get you there quicker. Or was yeah. That I've actually, or? I've always had in my wallet, I've always had a post-it note with like the next big goal. It wasn't like these small little like micro goals. It was very much so like when I was in eighth grade, I wanted to get into our acapella group in high school. And I had that for four years. I got in, I took it out. Um, and then I remember freshman year of college. I don't know why I put it in there. Maybe it was software. I put in uh, start a business. And it was just in a post-it note, my wallet for four years, I ended up starting a business, took it out. And then it was, what's the next thing? Okay. I want to get to this many users. So mm-hmm. I think for me, it was, it was very much so either just really uh, on a post-it note, but also my father forced me to write down a document on what I wanted to get out of like the accelerator program at that time. Sure. And so a lot of it was like, okay, who are you going to meet with? Because yeah, they can provide you a lot of great opportunities, but you also have to have initiative on your own. So I think my, my father, and my dad, like really pushed me to write these things down and uh, put them pen to paper because you're going to need to remember these. And I remember meeting you and you were like, Hey, if you, you should document every day, you should vlog mm-hmm. your, your entrepreneurial journey because you're going to want that later in life. Yeah. And that's one thing I do regret not taking your advice on <laughs> um, is because I look back and I'm like, wow, I really wish I would have had like a video of myself after I got my first check. Um, yeah. I really wish I would have had a video of myself launching our product. 
Um, and those are the things that like get you up in the morning, but, um, well, I laugh now, like I, I still said that to you a long time ago and now it's, it's almost like a concept, right? Like build in public, yeah. you'll, you'll see, yep. you'll, you'll see people build their company and they just tweet all the numbers and they document the whole journey. And that's essentially, I didn't have a good name for it, but that's basically what it became. Yeah. And I think it's, it allows and the good part about it. And what I, I still think I did it. Like I always had, I had a, we had a friend investor update and yeah, it was I all the people that, that didn't that didn't give us money, but gave us like time and attention and meetings and educated us on things we didn't know anything about. And I think that was, that was like our version of like kind of building in public. Uh, But I do, I do think nowadays it's building in public is all about asking for help. And I think that's really what it does. Like investor updates. Yeah. They're meant to update people on, on things and on your financials and, and how your business is doing, but it's also meant for you to be really strategic and how you can ask for help. And I think that's becoming a lot more popular within uh, VC and within um, startups in general is that your your capital is not just capital. Your capital yeah. is yeah. just a part of you building a relationship and them helping you out because it's beneficial on both ends. Yeah, I, I agree with your point about entrepreneurship really helps you or forces you, I guess, to meet interesting yeah. people, uh, especially when you're a founder and you have to, even if you're a technical founder, you still have to be selling and always like getting the yep. idea out there. And in corporate world, you probably can, you know, find your job, find your cube, sit in your there and, and sort of do your role. Um, and so whether you're an extrovert or introvert, like entrepreneurship is going to make you meet people. And I think, you know, there's a pro and con there with Sioux Falls, like Sioux Falls is we have probably less diversity uh, of interesting entrepreneurs doing big, big, crazy things than you might see in say Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. But the flip side of that is like the, the community is tight and small. I mean, like in just yeah. a couple of years after you graduated, everybody knew who you were. It seemed like you knew who everybody else was um, yeah. and you got pretty connected. So as a young professional speak to that, like how is your, how did entrepreneurship maybe broaden your network? I think, I think exactly to your point, it forces you to, reach out to people. Um, I also think entrepreneurship, especially when you have a business like recruiting or, or any B2B SaaS business and even B2C, um, everyone can be your customer. Anyone can be a referral into an organization. And so yeah. treating every meeting as like, hey, like I'm not going to bombard you with my business, but I want you to like me. If you're doing mm-hmm. B2B, you're still selling to a human being. And you yeah. want somebody else to say, hey, this, I really like Alex. I trust him. I think you just love to talk to him. And that's where a lot of my intros came into companies was, hey, I think you just find it really fascinating to talk to him. And so yeah. I think that that part of entrepreneurship is treating everything as somewhat a business opportunity in a light sense, uh, but also just constantly asking for help and being intrigued in what other people are doing. I think people just don't, when they go to networking events, like I, I've just... I think I used to be a lot more in networking events um, because I wanted to get my feet wet. And now it's just, I like most people I meet, I reach out over Twitter and that's, I'm just, and especially with uh, COVID being able to do it all remotely is great. So I'll just reach out and I'll say, Hey, like, I I love what you're working on. I'd love to chat. And most of the time they're absolutely willing. Um, But I think that entrepreneurship side really forced me to be curious and to always recognize these opportunities and also know, knowing that, Hey, like if I, if Chibiki doesn't work out, what's my plan? And I remember talking to you about it. I was like, I don't know what I want to do after this. And, and you're like, you'll just figure it out. Like you, you'll figure it out. You'll find a company that will value your wide range of experience that you have. Uh, But that entrepreneurship side really forced me to meet with these people, understand them, um, have professional conversations that most 22 year olds don't do. And um, yep. really build up that confidence in myself that, oh, yeah, I can, I can go to a meeting with a CEO at the age of 22 to try to sell them something. And that was never something I would ever been comfortable with even a year prior to that. Yeah. Yeah. And that skill idea, I think we're, we're really ingrained into us in the college level, this idea of um, get a specialty, get into, the, mm-hmm. into a job and, and, and go deep in that skill and move up the company. Um, Cause I felt the way you probably felt in my twenties of like, I do a, l- a little bit of everything as a mm-hmm. co-founder of a small company, but I don't know what my specialty is. I mean, you had a, a brother as a co-founder who was kind of part-time and no employees. Yep. So really a lot on your shoulders. Yeah. And so talk, talk to you. If someone's listening to this, thinking about like, well, what's my, my skill set or my specialty, how did you leverage those? What, what did you feel like running Joe B, he taught you the most. And how did you now use those skills to what you're doing now, which we'll get to next. 
Yeah, I think, um, especially within startups, I think being being a co-founder, especially with no employees and a part-time uh, technical co-founder, that's that was my brother doing all the code on the side. I think it really forced me to, uh, you, you have to be able to get your hands dirty in whatever part of business has to be done. And I think that's one thing that you will, corporate America just doesn't understand. It's, it's mm-hmm. either not my job. Oh, it's, um, it's Mark's, that's more Mark's thing to do. Uh, and so for me, it was more, oh yeah, we got this article that posted about us. Okay. And now I have to go and, and put it all on social or, okay, now uh, we have this idea. How am I going to formulate it into, into an actual product by going through the product development life cycle? And so I think the skill that I really gained from being a solo co-founder in a sense was having that, having that ability and not being afraid to just get my hands dirty in whatever part of the business. And that's why like my transition into a, a startup, a medium, small to medium sized startup has been successful is because you can't be afraid of going and getting your hands dirty. Yeah. You have to, yeah, you always like, um, like living like a poor person in the sense of, of always being scrappy, never wasting any money, um, doing things yourself until you absolutely have to is, is, um, is the best way to do it. It's like the, it's the, the poor man is resourceful, creative, scrappy. Um, and that's like what gets you from zero to one. And a one to two is just like hire the people that know the deep stuff. And I think that's really where good leaders, good leaders become great leaders is really based on, okay, filling it for your deficiencies. That's exactly mm-hmm. what you should be hiring. Um, if you're not great at this, that should be your first hire. And so our, our thing was always, our first hire was going to be somebody in sales. Cause I still, to this day, am not great, great at sales, which is why, um, I've always struggled in entrepreneurship at the same time. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I think that ability of like not having, um, like kind of losing a lot of that ego and just being like, I need, that needs to get done. I have to do it. Yep. Every month I have to do our, ta- I have to do our accounting. Every, yep. every year yep. I have to understand how we're going to do these taxes. And that's something that you don't learn in corporate America. Yeah. Um, perfect. So that's a good segue to where I wanted to go next, which you've alluded to, but we can, we, we could say the, the final chapter of the Joe Beakey story is it, it, it didn't quite maybe become what you thought it would, would become. And, and I'll say yeah. like, I always admired, I feel like you gave it a really fair shot, right? Like you were, you went home, lived at home, you were working at the brewery, you had side jobs, you were doing everything yeah. you could to try to like put this company on life support and save it. You pivoted, you tried some other kind of low code, no code versions of the, of the, of around the same problem. Yep. But why did you ultimately decide to, you know, shut it down? Yeah. I think the hardest part of um, entrepreneurship is, and some people would disagree on this. I think there is a point to say no, and there is a point to not give up, but just move on. And I think for me, not associating my success with Jabiki and Jabiki with my success and being a little bit more focused on, okay, like, what did I learn? Exactly what I alluded earlier of having that list of goals that I wanted to get out of it. Um, What did I learn from that situation? And so I think when I got to that point, I was like, you know what? I had a great experience. I learned a ton. I met amazing people. I built um, cool things that I'm actually proud of, but there are a lot of things I was lacking. I, I missed a team. I missed having people to talk mm-hmm. to and brainstorm with. Um, I missed the whole side of, of, of learning from other people. I think during the time I was learning from um, contacts and mentors and, um, and books, but I wasn't really learning from people and working alongside them and able to ask these key questions. And that's really what I missed. Um, and so I think there was a part that, yeah, it, it sucks that it didn't work out. Um, but at the same time, it, it got me to where I am today. And the fact that I understood that, um, that you do have to close the door on some things. Um, and it doesn't mean I'm not going to start a business again. It doesn't mean that I might take up Jabiki in a few years again and see if it works. Sure. Um, it might've sure. been just the wrong timing. It might've just, I didn't have experience. And once you understand that, that, yeah, like I was young, um, mm-hmm. if I would have done it differently, I would have just went and gotten a full-time job for a couple months. And, um, and that's one thing that I think a lot of people glamorizes this idea of dropping out of college to work on a startup, the idea of working on it right out of college. Uh, I have, I I have um, somebody, a friend of mine who's in college right now and running a startup and he asked me, should I drop out? And I said, no. Um, And I think that's one of the things is you don't have to, you don't have to sacrifice one goal for another. If your goal was graduate college, 
um, and your goal is also to start a company, figure out how to do them both at the same time. If your goal is to work on your startup and you also want to keep your relationship and marriage intact, you can do both. It's never yeah. a sacrifice in that situation. And that's one of the things that I've always um, kind of told a lot of people in, in when they're looking at that, that do I, do I go after it? Do I choose this? Do I choose that kind of path? It's you can do both until you absolutely have to choose one. And then, yeah. but that's an absolutely have to choose one situation. No, no, I think that's super good. And I liked how you went through the list of the things that you, um, you felt like maybe you were missing, right? Yeah. I think for a lot of folks who might be listening to this, you know, I, I kind of leaders in development or leaders who are growing, there's this sense of that the grass is always greener, right? And that, yeah. that that next job or that next promotion, or if I quit and go do this, everything will be perfect. Mm-hmm. And obviously it's just not true, right? Like it's still yeah. a job and there's still, there's perks and there's, there's challenges. And and so you recognize what you did miss being an entrepreneur because we glamorize entrepreneurs a lot, but it's really hard and often lonely, yeah. especially as a solo founder. And, and well, so was, I think that was one of yeah, the, go ahead. one huge part of it was that, that loneliness. Like I've, I've always been open about my struggles with mental health. And, and that's one of the things that like, when it came down to it, it was okay. Um, I was, I was um, taking anti-anxiety meds. I was meeting with my uh, therapist all the time. And I think that's one thing that like, if I ever start a business again, that mental health part will be a huge part of our values. And hmm. we will have, uh, we will have somebody come in for you to talk to that is unrelated to the organization and can't talk to me. And that's one of the things that I think um, a lot of founders refuse to acknowledge is be vulnerable about those struggles. Like, if you talk entrepreneur to entrepreneur, they always say like, you ask them, how's it going? They're like, it's hard. Yeah. But you ask, nobody asks, nobody outside of entrepreneurship, if they ask it, you're like, yeah, it's going great. Cause they yeah. just won't understand. Hustling, and that's yeah. where like the connection of entrepreneurs have together. But I think that mental health part was a huge part of me kind of saying, okay, this is, this is getting to a point which like, yeah, I should move on. Um, yeah. and, I've, and I've tried my best and I can be proud of that, but let's close the door. Let's go on to the next thing in life. You said a key thing there, which was like, I realized that my success wasn't tied, you know, to Joe Beaky. And I want to ask you about that because uh, I felt that often, right? Like, um, mm-hmm. um, John, I'm the Lemonly guy or Lemonly is, you know, like yeah. you, your identity, <laughs> like we have a yellow door in our house, right? Like we're always on brand, right? It becomes like a huge part of who you are. My daughter, my two-year-old can say Lemonly amongst all the words she can, that she knows. Um, and so it becomes a really big part of who you are, but like, there's always going to be an ending. Like you said, whether it doesn't work, you exit, there's, there's always mm-hmm. an ending and there's always another chapter. So how have you been, was that a struggle or did you move through that pretty quickly post Joe Beaky? Um, I think it was in some senses, it was a struggle in some senses it wasn't. I think um, like Joe Beaky, it's hard. Cause I haven't like closed the business. It's still in business. Like we still are running the site. We still have okay. it. Up. And so you still have that, like, it's almost like I'm in that limbo stage of like, yep, it's a hundred percent done or it's, or we're you still let go yet. <laughs> I haven't let go yet. So, uh, and that's something I hope to do. I think for me, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with companies. I've been actively trying to get companies to at least just acquire the assets of Jabiki because I think there's a great part of it that I think can be grown on and, 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 and worked with, I think it's just, I, I'm not that person right now. And that's totally fine. Um, I think for me, the the fact of just closing it down and burying it is scary and it sucks, but at the same time trying to figure out, okay, well, we, well, could we, uh, could we sell it and, and then just use it for this? Could we white label it and people could have it as a marketplace, uh, low code type of solution that they could implement. But I think, I think that that idea of like closing the business fully was always tough, but when you, COVID helped in the sense that um, there was nothing else to do. Like business mm-hmm. was going slow. It was kind of a natural thing that happened when, when March hit, no companies were really hiring, nobody hiring, knew what to do, yeah. as well as uh, our visual component of Jabiki, which was kind of like the Zillow for companies. Everyone's working from home now. So our whole visual side of the feel and look of Jabiki was pretty much gone because we're not showing pictures of people's uh, home offices or their yeah. bedrooms or their living rooms. We're showing pictures of these offices that might not even be around in two years. Yeah. And so that was like the other part of like, okay, this is, it's, it's kind of pushing on the wayside, but it was, it was tough, but I think that connection and, and being able to understand that, no, I learned a lot from that. And people, 
and anyone around me, if I asked how I did, even if I close it down, they'd be like, you killed it. Like, look at all the stuff you learned, look at the things you created. And that's one of the things that if you sit in yourself and say, you failed, you failed, you failed. Um, it's just, you're going to be in this cycle of feeling as though there, nothing came of it. Where if you go to people and you say, Hey, I'm thinking about closing down the business. Hey, I'm thinking about going and getting a full-time job. Most of them, pretty much all of them will say, do it. Like, you don't have to work on this. This isn't you. Like you're Alex. You're not just Jabiki Alex. Yeah. Like you are Alex and first and foremost. And so I think having those people around that are able to support you and when you start a business, but at the same time, when you end a business, I think it's super important. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's really good advice. Do you, um, I'm trying to remember that the last time we spoke when you were on the job hunt and, and probably some of these conversations you just described were partly like, what should I do? But also what should I do next? So has it been about six months at the new startup or how long? Yeah, five, five and a half months. I okay, believe. perfect. Yeah. And tell me, uh, what have you learned in, in six months now going from being almost a solo founder to an employee at, you said, a medium-ish, medium to smallish company? Yeah. So um, it was the interesting part is like how I came across Factory Fix as well. So Factory Fix is um, a hiring marketplace and kind of productized recruiting company specifically for manufacturing companies. And so I didn't really go far away from what I was working on. I yeah, stayed in the recruiting problem. hiring industry, which I was passionate about um, and actually found out about them through the hustle common newsletter that a lot of people, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people read and just got acquired, I saw them yeah. posted about it um, and just reached out. And I said, Hey, I love what you're working on. Um, I think it'd be awesome uh, for me to help out and join the team in any way. And about uh, two days later, Pat, the CEO reached out and um, we had a few conversations. I had some other conversations with people in the organization and, and it just, it was a, it was a great fit. I had experience in the industry. I was coming in with this scrappy can do kind of attitude that they needed somebody that can just work on things that haven't really been worked on before. And it went from pretty much the first meeting to a week later, I, I was starting. And, cool. and that was like an amazing experience. And it proved that this was probably a place I really wanted to be because they move fast um, and they aren't afraid to just go on a gut feeling. But I think when it comes to the things that I've learned, it's just the passive learning part of, of working with other people is huge. Being able to just sit in a meeting and listen and, uh, and just like intake all that information of people chatting. I've learned so much passively by just being there. And so I think a lot of people don't like, you can read books. That's great. You can listen to podcasts. That's awesome. But there is a part of learning that is just being present and being in a situation that you will never be able to replicate through a book or through a podcast. Mm -hmm. So that's one of them, like the passive learning side. I think the second one uh, is, is really um, being able to communicate is one thing I've really learned that is, is not hard. I think it's just a different type of challenge being a solo founder I don't report to anyone. And so now it's a lot more of, okay, how can I explain this for myself? How can I explain it for for my boss? How can I explain it for um, the developers that I'm working with and are actually building these products? I think being able to learn how to do that communication is super important. But I think overall, it's it's an experience that was an easy transition, just in the sense of going from a tiny startup, one person thing to 40 people. It's a pretty easy transition versus the, the um, one person startup to a giant organization that has thousands of employees is just sure. that that was would have been too far. But I mean, you touched on some really important points like communication, yeah, having having a boss having co workers, yeah. you can't just do whatever you want and not be able to justify it, right? There's some there's some mm-hmm. process or rules or some culture to follow, certainly when you're part of a team. Um, and do you do you now feel differently about uh, as you look back about Joe Biki or look forward about thinking whether or not you would do this again or how has it's only been six months but how has being inside a startup changed the way you looked at your startup yeah I think it's it's interesting in two sense of being inside of a startup and and just in general industry uh, agnostic but being inside of a startup that is very similar to the uh, to the startup that I was building like the first two months I was sitting there and texting my brother and co-founder Javiki, like, dude, we could have done this. I didn't even know this was possible. I was like, I didn't know that was, I didn't know that you could do that. Um, and yeah. so there was so yeah. much of the, of that, that being in industry was like, oh, 
wait, we could integrate with them. That would have made this a lot easier. We could have <laughs> um, worked with them. That would have made it a lot easier. Uh, but those are the things that you're just like, as a young entrepreneur, you're naive. Um, and those are the things now that I'm like, okay, when it comes to building a startup, yeah, building a startup's great, but like leverage all that's out there already. And that was one of the things that I learned early on at Factory Fix was we were leveraging all these other platforms as well for our success. And you just mm-hmm. hone in on what you're good at and you allow other people to be good at what they do and you can all work together for success. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'd say that was like one of the big things that I've, I've learned, but that communication side, you nail it right in the head. It's working with other people as a different challenge and being your own boss is great. Um, but you, you, you can you do have to be good at too. Both. You can develop yeah, bad you, habits, yeah, it's, I think. Yeah, a very bad habit sometimes. Uh, so the last one I want to hit, hit you with, and then we'll do some some rapid fire at the end. Um, you know, back to where we started, we're just like a, a, a leader. You know, like, am I, you know, am I a leader? Like, why do you want me on this podcast? We're 37 episodes in. We've talked to all sorts of different leaders, some yep. who clearly are leader by title or by age and experience, and some maybe not. Um, what... You know, I think at, in the in our twenties, especially, or even you know the first decade or so of our career, there's this feeling of not moving fast enough, or not growing quickly enough. Or leaders often are ambitious people, even if they're not mm-hmm. outwardly ambitious. They're like they they put themselves to high standards, and and they want to keep getting better. And speak to that piece, right? Like when you were building a company, I'm sure you had big dreams of employees, revenue, users. You talked about the the goal in, inside your wallet. Um, how have you reconciled with, with that feeling of like not moving fast enough or not building big enough for, and I wouldn't say reconciled, maybe you actually very much at peace with like now working inside a company. So that's that feeling though of, of um, speed can be sort of uh, a heavy weight to bear. Yeah. I think, I think for me, it was, it was kind of understanding the the whole aspect of like what is kind of known as like being an internal influencer, like a company influencer. I think, okay within the organization, you can have leaders in which are, are leaders because of their title. Uh, they're leaders because um, they run a team and they're a team lead, or you can have leaders that are just naturally leaders and people talk to. And so mm-hmm. for me, when I came into the organization and came into factory fix, what I did is I wanted to learn everything there is to know about everyone. And so I paid for virtual coffees. I bought people coffee at Starbucks and I just spent $5 each employee. And I just talked to them. I wanted to get to know them. And, and that's the thing about like being a young leader. It's, it's, you don't wait till you get that position. You don't wait till you have to lead. You just lead. And, and that's always been kind of my viewpoint, even as a kid, when we had baseball, uh, when I, because I played baseball through high school, I, over the summer, I would always have the team together and we'd watch a movie or we'd hang out in the backyard because I thought that for me, it was important to get everyone together outside of the environment that we're constantly always in. Because mm-hmm. a team that actually knows and understands and, 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 and can actually communicate with each other effectively is the one that's going to succeed. But I think, yep. I think that internal influencer part is key for a lot of people who are want to be leaders is you're never going to get a chance to be a leader until you prove you're a leader before. And that's the thing that people just need to realize is you don't just, you're not, you're voted a leader. Even if you're hired into being a leadership role, you are voted to be a leader based on how you've led in the past. And so being that internal influencer from a young age is super important. But I also think understanding that it is your time to learn from really good leaders. And so whether it's uh, somebody in your organization, like a CEO or your boss, um, or just another internal influencer within an organization is somebody else you can learn learn from. So I always, and, and people have different leadership styles and can learn from people differently, which is... Um, I always compare it to like Sean McVay and Pete Carroll are very much so like, like Liz, uh, Georgie is the very much so the cheerleader type of leader. It's the sure. person that's going to get you through when they get a touchdown, they're cheering, they're high five and they're super excited for them. Then you have on the op- opposite end, you have like the Bill Belichick. It's you got that touchdown. Yeah. That's your job to get that touchdown. I don't need to be excited because you just did your job. And there's yeah. two sides of it. And, and you can like the Bill Belichick style leader, and you can also like the Sean McVay and Pete Carroll leader. And that's totally fine. I think just mm-hmm. being able to recognize what you need is going to be successful. And understanding that on what you need is going to help you become a better leader to other people because you understand yourself first. Yeah, that's really good stuff. Nice work. I like that. Well, let's, let's move there then, and, and we'll get to know you a little bit more. Final questions. Um, 
what is a book that you recommend or a book you've read recently that really influenced you? I think right uh, when I was starting Jabiki, I read a book called The 20 Minute Networking Meeting. And that is a book, whenever I meet with somebody who wants to get into networking, I buy the book for them. And it's, it's very actionable. It's kind of, okay, here's the cold email template that you're going to send out. Here's the 20 minute structure of that meeting. This 20 minutes is doable. It's not too long. It's not too short. Here's how you're going to structure each minute of the meeting. Here's how you're going to structure your own, your own one minute pitch of yourself. And so that kind of gave me the viewpoint and, and the formula and equation for networking. And still to this day, I only schedule 20 minute meetings. I've actually gone down to 15 or 10 minute meetings for a lot of people as well, because I know that if I'm very strategic about what I want to talk about, I can get done with that. So 20 minute networking meeting um, by Marsha Ballinger is one of the best books that I've ever read. And still to this day, I use all the time when I need to work on a cold email for a cold outreach. Cool. I'll check that out. I don't know that one. Um, Gosh, we're heading into a year into this pandemic. So I've been asking guests, how do you unplug or de-stress, uh, get your money. We talked about mental, mental health, which is so, so important. What's your tip there? Yeah, I think for me, it's always been, it's always been fitness, um, has always kind of been my, my break for the day. And it, it's especially hard too being working from home and being able to separate. And luckily for me, being able to have an office in a different section than, than my living room or than my kitchen or than my sure. bedroom has been super important, but yeah, de-stressing is, is mostly, um, working out and then, and then spending time with the, uh, my loved ones in a safe way, <laughs> yeah. as safe as you can be nowadays, um, I think has been the part that's, that's gotten me through, but having, having so many pieces of technology you can utilize to talk with people you haven't talked to in a long time because you just never did, um, yeah. being able to get a group of people on a zoom, um, and just chatting and updating each other on life, I think is, is a great gift that COVID has brought and it's brought a lot of people together. Um, even though it has felt like it's taken a lot of people apart. I could use a little more 20 minute zoom calls too. I think maybe we should, re- <laughs> you should be handing that book out to more people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alex, what is your superpower? What's the one thing you believe you do better than anyone else? Huh? I think, yeah, I think it really relates to um, being the utility player. I think there are places for different types of people. Like we talked about earlier, there are the places to be really deep on a very small subset of subjects, whether you're a software engineer working specifically in a type of, uh, in a type of code base. Um, But I also think there is a huge uh, undervaluization of utility players and being able to fill in where needed, especially at the startup level. But I think in large organizations are starting to realize that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Good leaders can fill in with, um, and can fill in the jobs in which they're, uh, which in, in which people in the organization actually do. They aren't just the people who report down, they're the people who are willing to get their hands dirty. And I think that's the utility player. Those are the people that, um, that others in the organization look up to or the ones that actually understand what they're going through. And I think you, you only get that if you're a utility player and you're able to fill in in all of these different areas. And so I'd say, yeah, that's my, that's my superpower is being a utility player. Yeah. And directly correlates to what we were saying earlier when you were, you know, a solo founder, like you had to do all the pieces. Yeah. yeah I love it. Uh, lastly, who are the leaders uh, that have influenced you, whether you know them or you've studied them? family, friends, mentors, people you read about? Yeah, I think, um, not to be cliche, John, but I think you're definitely one of them. I think since I've, since I met you, it's, you're always the person that like, when I have a business idea, I go to, to kind of gut check it. And you're always not afraid to be like, Hey, I don't think that's, I don't think that's it. Or yeah, I think that could be it, but you have to work on this. So I think you, Mm -hmm. number one. Um, and then, my dad's always been somebody I've always looked up to. He's been uh, in operations. He's worked in manufacturing companies and uh, and other companies at that. And I think that's one of the things that I always constantly am learning from him is the aspect of being vulnerable, being an empathetic leader mm-hmm. and understanding and, um, and doing the tough things for yourself because you, uh, you need to be there for your employee, I think is another thing that that's I've uh, really learned. But you're, yeah, I think you constantly are taking ideas from a lot of people. And that's one thing that I always tell people, don't read a book and look at it as the Bible. Um, read a book and look at it as 
as uh, pieces that you can take out and build your own Bible. And so like, for me, it's like, I don't really look at a book and a leader or anything like that and say like, that's exactly what I want to be. I look at that and I say, you know, these are the qualities that I think I'm really good at that I can double down on. And this is what I see from that person. Okay. And then this other person is really good at this. Okay. How can I learn from them and get better at this? And so I think having that, that idea of like everyone has different things to learn from and different things to give rather than treating one leader, one person as I, that's the ideal for being a good leader. Yeah. You don't want to carbon copy. You might as well borrow and steal and and, and, and iterate and change and make it your, make it your own. And yeah. I loved what you said about, um, I can't remember the word you used, but sort of that like osmosis of being around a team now and learning, um, just underestimating how, how valuable that is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's gotten me further in six months than I think I would have gotten in a couple of years in the sense of just learning from other people. That's great. Well, thanks for uh, taking me up on my offer and saying yes and coming on the show. I think this, this, uh, your story is not only really interesting and compelling, but I think people will find a lot of value in where you are. And uh, I believe you're a leader and you've taught me a ton of stuff too. So I'm excited to follow you over this, uh, the next year and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. It was fun being on and um, hopefully everyone can kind of take a little bit of nuggets from what I had to say. But I think when it comes down to it, last note, like find the leader that you want and find the leader that you that you really admire. And if it's not at your company, don't be afraid to go find another leader within the company. And if it's not your boss, go search out a different person. Um, a leader is not just a person you report to, but it's a person you look up to. And so I think having that idea that they can be two separate people is, is one that I think is going to help a lot of people in the larger organizations that probably struggle to find really good leaders. Yeah. And everyone deserves a good leader. So that's a great point. We'll end there. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thanks, John. Take care. All right, everyone. That was episode 37 with Alex Gutenberger. I hope you loved that conversation. I thought Alex was very open, very honest, very transparent. I learned some things and I hope you did too. I'm excited to follow someone like Alex and follow his career, both inside this company, and I'm certain he'll probably start another company someday. So keep your tabs on Alex. And and most importantly, remember, leaders are not defined by their job title, by their years of experience, by their salary, or where they went to school. We need leaders all up and down every organization and nonprofits and teams and families, and we need more of them. So I want you to be the next leader. Let's step up. Let's do it. Now, remember, we drop new episodes of the Lead More podcast every Thursday. You can subscribe online, give us a five-star rating, or check out leadmorepodcast.com to see all of our past 37 episodes. Take care. Be well. Thanks for listening.